Hi, so I'd like to give a 10 minute overview of my paper, The Allocation of Talent in US Economic Growth, which is uh, published in Econometrica in 2019 in joint with uh, Ching Tai Shei, Eric Hurst, and Pete Klino. So the starting point for this paper is a fact that um, at some level we all know, but it, it's also a fact that's just never ceases to stun me when I think about it. Um, and that is, think about the United States in 1960. In 1960, more than 90% of all doctors, lawyers, and managers in the US were white men, more than 90%. So contrast that with the world in 2010, in the United States in 2010, that number had fallen to 60%. So over the past 50 or 60 years, there's been an enormous change in the allocation of talent. And the point of this paper is to ask, well, to what extent has that contributed to economic growth? And to illustrate this, I think, let me just point to a, to a nice example. Uh, there are three listed at the bottom of the, the slides. Um, let's take Sandra Day O'Connor. Sandra Day O'Connor, future Supreme Court Justice, you know, first woman Supreme Court Justice in the United States, graduates from Stanford Law School in 1952, number three in her class. Incredibly talented person, future Supreme Court Justice. The only job she can get in the private sector is as a legal secretary. So there was a tremendous misallocation of talent in the 1950s. And part of what's suggested on this slide is over the last 50 or 60 years, that allocation of talent has been improved. So how much of growth results from that? You could tell similar stories with Ruth Bader Ginsburg or David Blackwell in economics of contraction mapping uh, theory fame. Um, so, so what we do is we say, suppose the distribution of talent for each occupation is identical for whites and blacks and men and women. That's our key identifying assumption. Well, then the numbers that I showed you on the previous slide suggest that there was a misallocation of talent in both 1960 and 2010, but there was less misallocation in 2010 than in 1960. And it's really the, the changes in occupational shares over time that are gonna reveal this misallocation in a way that I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Um, so the key question we ask, how much of productivity growth in the last 50 years is due to this improved allocation of talent? So this graph is another way of sort of illustrating more precisely what we're doing. This shows you what fraction of each group works in high-skilled occupations. Okay, so if the distribution of talent is the same in each of these groups, then the fraction working as a doctor, lawyer, engineer, mathematician, or manager should be the same. Maybe all these numbers should be 20 or 25%. And if you look in blue, you see the distribution in 1960 was very different from equal and from 20 or 25 percent, whereas in red, it's closer, okay? Not back to, to, to equal, not all the same at 20 or 25 percent, but, but closer. Um, it's really these kind of differences that we're going to use to identify misallocation, because again, if the distribution of talent's the same, all these numbers should be the same, and deviations from the numbers being the same reveals underlying barriers. That's kind of the, uh, the way our, our paper works. Okay, so what framework do we use? Um, one of the fun things about this, this project is we use the Eaton and Cordham trade model, the 2002 Econometrica paper, um, but just take that, that model and apply it to occupational choice. And it applies um, quite easily and quite naturally. Each person gets a random talent draw in every occupation, I could be a plumber or a doctor or a lawyer or an economist or, or a secretary. Um, each person gets a draw in each occupation and it's the same distribution for every group. Okay, people then choose their schooling and occupation subject to human capital and labor market taxes or subject to barriers. And it's these barriers that distort the allocation of talent and move it away from say 50-50 for men and women. Right? And so it's these deviations of occupation shares from population shares that tell us about the barriers and that are going to allow us to uh, plugged into the Eaton and Cordham kind of framework back out how much of growth is due to changing, changing barriers. The data we use is from uh, the decennial census in the United States and more recently from the American Community Survey. So here's the kind of uh, evidence we look at in the paper. This is a graph uh, for uh, women, uh, young age women in 1980. And it shows you on the horizontal axis sort of the occupational choice and on the vertical axis, the wage gap, okay? The, in particular on the horizontal axis, it's what fraction of white women work in each occupation 
divided by the fraction of white men who are working in that occupation. So to illustrate, in 1980, white women were 64 times more likely to work as secretaries than white men, 64 times more likely. Right, so an enormous distortion relative to the one for one. If, if there were no uh, distortions, no barriers, everyone would be on one here. So 64 times more likely to work as a secretary. On the other hand, white women were four times less likely to work as lawyers than white men. You put these together, uh, women were, were 250 times more likely to be secretaries than lawyers. Okay, that's the horizontal axis, enormous departures from that 50-50 split telling us about the misallocation. What were the consequences of that misallocation for wages? Well, the interesting thing in this graph is it reveals, despite the enormous differences in quantities between secretaries and lawyers, the wage gap was the same. The wage gap for women in, as lawyers versus as secretaries was both 30%, okay? And more generally in this picture, you see that wage gaps are uncorrelated with the quantities. In, our, in the data that we look at, and this is gonna be true in our model too, in the data we look at, discrimination barriers show up in quantities primarily, especially across occupations, and don't show up in prices. In our framework, in a simple, in a simple version of our framework, the wage gap would be the same in every occupation. And so you know, barriers in secretaries and lawyers change the quantities, and then the prices reflect the aggregate of the barriers. Um, uh, so looking at the quantities seems to be more important than looking at the prices in, in, in the data and in our setup. Um, next thing, we, we uh, break people into young, middle-aged, and old. It's the synthetic cohort kind of approach to the, to the uh, census data. And so what this graph is showing is female wage gaps relative to white men um, for, say, young, middle-aged, and old. The young here is 25 to 34, uh, 35 to 44, 45 to 54. And what you can see if you look at this graph is that most of the changes in wage gaps occur by cohort rather than over time. And in our framework, the sort of cohort effects are going to look more like human capital frictions than like labor market frictions. And so, you know, one of the findings in our paper is that, you know, both are important, both labor market frictions and human capital frictions are important, but the human capital frictions seem to do more of the work. Uh, kind of motivated by, by, by this graph. Okay, what's the key finding? The key finding in the paper is that something like 40% of growth in GDP per person over the last 50 years, from 1960 to 2010, 40% of growth in GDP per person comes from declining barriers. Okay, it's a surprisingly large number. What we show in green is if the barriers were constant at their 1960 levels, that's how GDP would have changed whereas it actually changed by this amount, and so the difference is, is 40%. More generally, let me show you these in a, in a table. And so uh, what we've got, these are average annual growth rates. So between 1960 and 2010, GDP per person uh, in our, you know, our census data version grew at 1.7% per year. If the barriers had remained at their 1960 levels, growth would have only been 1% per year. So the difference is 0.7 or 41% of the overall growth. Okay. Interestingly, you could do this by per worker as well, and then you can look at labor force participation, and the two obviously add up to, to give you GDP per person. And what we find is um, the differences are split roughly equally, that's what uh, these numbers in green show you, between growth in productivity, GDP per worker, and growth in labor force participation. So, you know, a big part of what's going on is the barriers to women are declining and women are moving from the home sector to the market sector. That's kind of the labor force participation number. That's half of this 0.7, roughly speaking. And then another big part is this improved allocation of talent, allowing the Sandra Day O'Connors and the David Blackwells of the world to work where they're most productive. That raises productivity, and that's kind of another half of the story. Okay. Um, you can see other interesting numbers in these slides. You know, the, the, the frictions, changing frictions explains 90% of the rise in labor force participation. So again, it seems to be a, a big part of what's going on. Finally, another thing we consider in the paper is, well, how much more do we have to go? We, we said that from 1960 to 2010, the allocation of talent improved. As we saw in the simple graph, we weren't at 20 or 25 in, in every group. So what if we were to get rid of all the barriers altogether? 
Well, the analysis suggests that that would raise GDP by an additional 10%. If you look back at the, the numbers on the previous slide, it looks like we've had you know, two thirds or three quarters of the progress that, that there is to make, but there's another 10% of GDP that we could pick up if we just got rid of these barriers. Okay, so just to conclude, you know, one of the interesting findings to, to me is that, you know, it, it sort of emphasizes the point that the U.S. does not have a perfect allocation of resources. There's, uh, there's gains left on the table, and those gains were historically large. So a surprisingly large amount of growth uh, during this 50-year period comes from declining barriers. We're used to thinking about growth coming from ideas and capital and, and labor and education. All those things are true. But the barriers explain a surprisingly large amount, 40% of growth in GDP per person or 24% of growth in GDP per worker. Finally, this same idea can be applied in many other contexts. So the allocation of talent within other countries, the allocation of talent across countries. You know, how, many, how many Bill Gateses and Thomas Edison's and Marie Curries are there in other countries waiting to realize their talent and produce ideas that the, the rest of the world benefits from? Okay, and there's a link to the paper at the end of the slide. So, uh, thanks very much for sticking with me, and I'll stop there.